Welcome back to Econ 103 Introduction to Microeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at a walkthrough for a monopoly or monopolistic competition. Uh, what we're going to be really looking at is the math side of this. So it doesn't really matter if we're talking about monopoly or monopolistic competition. Really, any firm with market power is going to have a similar structure, mathematically speaking. Uh, the real difference comes to the elasticity of the demand curves, which will be beyond what we're looking at in this video. So what we're going to take a look at as we go through how to calculate the Q star, optimal quantity produced by either a monopolist or a monopolistically competitive firm. We'll figure out how to calculate the price. That is the single market price that they will end up charging. And we'll work through to do a welfare analysis. So that is the consumer, producer, and social surplus before we had a monopoly. And then again, after if the market was served by a monopolist. That being said, let's go jump over and let's get started. Okay, so what we have to start off is just our standard supply and demand diagram as you would typically have. So let's start off just by drawing this just to visualize what's happening. Where you have our axes, of course, our vertical axes, that's our price, our horizontal axes, that is our quantity. Downward sloping, we have our demand starting at 150, dropping down. Uh, there we go. So, demand 150, 150 divided by 5, that gives me my horizontal intercept of 30. Again, the way we get that, we take this intercept, divide it by the magnitude of the slope, and we get the opposite intercept. For our supply curve, we're starting off at 30. And we're upward sloping, slope of plus 5, so same magnitude of slope as our demand curve. And this gives us our supply or our marginal cost. So we have our initial starting condition. At this initial starting condition, we would have what the market would have, right? So if this was instead of a monopoly, if this was perfectly competitive, that is we had just a whole bunch of really, really tiny firms, that is, they were all really small. If we had all these small firms, lots of small firms, then this would be where we'd end up, at our allocatively efficient scenario, at a equilibrium price of supply and demand, giving us market price and quantity. To start off, let's calculate this, just so we have it for a reference point. And then once we calculate this, we'll then pretend that the entire market gets bought out by a monopolist, and as the entire market gets bought out by a monopolist, we'll see what the difference is. Okay, so to solve for this, what we're going to do, just like in every other case, we start off by setting our supply and demand equal. So price equals to price, we get, uh, it helps if I use the right tool, uh, we get 150 minus 5Q equal to 30 plus 5Q. Let's use a bit of a thicker pen stroke for that. Again, now what we want to do is we want to consolidate and isolate our Qs. So let's move them both over to the right-hand side. We get 150 equals 30 plus 10Q. I divide, or not divide, sorry, subtract 30 from both sides. We have 120 equals 10Q. That is, to finish this off, we have 12 equals Q. So... If this market was serviced by perfectly competitive firms, that is, if this market was allocatively efficient, we would have a quantity exchange of 12. Next, we need to figure out what that market clearing price is. What is the market clearing price for a quantity exchanged of 12? Well, we take this quantity, we put it back into either the demand or the supply equation. Let's go take a look at the supply. I find that guy just easier to work with. So we get price, that's a funny P. Price equals 30 plus 5Q. Q was 12. So we get 30, to, 30 times, wow, no, sorry, 30 plus 5 times 12, which gives us a price of 90. So let's write that point there as our starting reference point. Okay. From here, before we carry on to the monopolist, right, I promised, I keep promising, we are going to get there. But let's start off by taking a look at just our consumer and producer surplus. So starting off, we have our consumer surplus. 
Again, consumer surplus below my demand, above the price that I pay, all the way out to that quantity exchanged. So I'd get this triangle here as my consumer surplus, which equals just a triangle, one half base of 12 times a height of 150 to 90, that's a height of 60. So we get 360 as our consumer surplus. Similarly, we work out our producer surplus, and that's our initial producer surplus. Again, this is going to be above my willingness to accept, so above my supply curve, all the way out to our quantity exchanged, below the price I do accept. And so we get this red triangle going on, which again is just a triangle. So 1 half, base of 12, height of 90 minus 30. Well, 90 minus 30, that's 60 again. Hey, with those numbers, I get the exact same producer surplus of 360. Now, in this case, this is all we have. We have consumers, we have producers, we don't have anything else funny going on. This is our simplest case. So, all together, we end up getting our social surplus, our initial social, social surplus, as just consumer plus producer. That is, we get a social surplus of 720. Okay, so all of that just to show our starting condition, that is if this market was just serviced by perfectly competitive firms, if this market was able to be allocatively efficient. Okay, but now let's say some big fat cat capitalist comes along, buys up all of these perfectly competitive firms, that is it's no longer serviced by lots of small firms, this market is now just serviced by the monopolist. Well, let's just clean up our work here. Uh, consolidate things a little bit and we can restart with a fresh diagram and we can see what the impacts of that are. Okay, so restarting back at square one, uh, what we said, we said some fat cat capitalists bought out all of these perfectly competitive firms and now they're all one firm, that is they're now just a monopoly. Well, keep in mind with a monopoly, they see the demand curve for the actual market demand curve. So we have our demand equal to the average revenue of the firm. Uh, as we see, this is also where we get our price from. Now beyond that, problem with the monopolist is every time they increase their quantity produced then, or their quantity supplied, they have to similarly end up lowering their price in order to sell the extra units. The result of that, and again, go back to the monopoly video to see how we get this, but the result of this is that you get a marginal revenue curve that is two times as steep as our demand curve. So that is where our demand curve is 150 minus 5Q. We've just gone, we've said, hey, if that's our demand, twice as steep, this is our marginal revenue. If it's twice as steep, hey, if that guy intersects at 30, this guy will intersect at 15. And then similarly, our price from that marginal revenue, that's going to be our demand, so 150 minus two times the slope. So instead of a slope of minus five, it'll be a slope of minus 10 Q. Okay. Now that we have this, we need to figure out, okay, what is our Q star? That is, now that we have a monopolist operating this market, how many goods is this monopolist going to produce? And once they figure out how many goods they're going to produce, what uh, what price are they going to charge altogether? Well, okay, keeping in mind back from our producer theory, Q star profit maximizing level of output can be determined where our marginal revenue equals our marginal cost. So, okay, as so you've looked through things, marginal revenue, that was just as we had it right there. All right, marginal revenue, that's what we just figured out. What about this guy? What about our marginal cost? Well, hey, keep in mind our supply curve. We said that was our marginal cost curve. So we get a marginal cost right there from our supply. What we want to do is we want to equate the two. So just looking at it graphically, that's going to be that point right there. As we equate those two, what do we end up getting? So right there, I'll just drag that down a bit. That would be our value of. Q star, profit maximizing level of output. And then once we get Q star, what we're going to do is we're going to take that Q star and we're going to figure out what price to charge. 
in order to figure out what price to charge, we'll drag this all the way back up to our demand curve. That is our demand curve is also the maximum willingness to pay. So hey, that's the price people are willing to pay. That's the price the monopolist is gonna charge them. They'll take that price and they'll drag that all the way across and we'll figure out what our market price is if this market was serviced by a monopolist. But first things first, we need to set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. So starting off, marginal revenue. Uh, again, using the right tool helps a lot. Uh, 150 minus 10Q. That guy equals our marginal cost, which was just our supply curve, 30 plus 5Q. Okay, great. From this point here, we want to consolidate and isolate. So consolidate the Qs together and then isolate them. So we'll add 10 to both sides, 10Q to both sides. We get 150 equals 30 plus 15Q. I'll bring that 30 over. Uh, we get 120 equals 15Q. And then to finish ourselves off, 120 divided by 15 we have 8 equals Q. So, and that's our Q star, right? That's that guy right there. We get our new quantity exchanged. So let's update. Let's throw that in. We have our quantity exchanged underneath a monopoly of 8 units. So we see that underneath a monopoly situation, the monopoly severely cuts the amount they're producing from 12 units all the way down to 8 units. By cutting production, what they're able to do is they're able to artificially restrict supply. By artificially restricting supply, what they can then do is push up the price, and we need to figure out what that price then is. So how do we get that? Well, the way we get that is we take eight, and we just kind of follow it, right? Okay, eight all the way up to the demand curve, and then across. So. Let's go do that. We have our demand curve right here. Let's go take eight and put it in for Q and solve for what our price is. So we get price equals 150 minus, this is the demand, minus 5Q. Q is eight. Five times eight, that gives me 40. And then 150 minus 40, we get our price. So that gives us a price of $110. So again, when you witness, monopolist comes in, they restrict their supply. By restricting their supply, they can push up the price, pushing up the price from 90 all the way up to 110. Okay, now that we've figured this out, and I just want to pause for a second here. We've actually done this for a monopolist. As I said at the start of the video, the graph, this whole idea that marginal revenue is two times the slope of the demand, this is true for any firm that has market power. That is, this would be true for a monopolist, for an oligopolist, or for a monopolistically, a firm in a monopolistically competitive market. So if really the questions would be, hey, figure out the Q star and price for a monopolist or for a firm in a monopolistically competitive marketplace. Either way would be the exact same process, exact same process. The distinction between monopoly or monopolistic competition is de depending on how many competitors you have and barriers to entry, those end up coming in later when we talk about the long run. So we'll discuss that in the end part of this video. But for this initial startup point, exactly the same. Okay, that being said, let's move on. Let's take a look at our welfare analysis. So for our welfare, we want to figure out the consumer and the producer surplus. So let's go just take a look at them geometrically first, and then we'll calculate them. So first, geometrically, let's start off with our consumer surplus. So consumer surplus is below my willingness to pay up until that quantity exchange of eight above the price I do pay. So we see our consumer surplus is just going to be this uh, relatively small triangle. What about the producer surplus? Well, the producer surplus is going to be above our willingness to accept all the way up to the quantity which we exchange, so eight, and below the price that I do accept. So I accept a price of 110. 
So we see in this scenario here, yeah, our producer surplus is relatively large. So we get all of that bit as our producer surplus. Okay, now, now that we've kind of identified them geometrically, let's go calculate them. So starting off, starting off with our consumer surplus and consumer surplus one for the new one, it's just a triangle. So that's one half base of eight times a height of 150 minus 110, that's uh, 40. And so what we get is one half times eight times 40, we have our consumer surplus of 160. Perfect. I mean, we take a look at that perfect, but uh, we see consumers all together. They've lost. They're kind of they're kind of sad in this scenario. What else do we have? Well, we have our producer surplus to figure out. So producer surplus one for again the new one. We see that our producer surplus is kind of a funny shape altogether. So again, not a problem. We just have to break it up into shapes we know how to deal with. That is triangles and rectangles. So hey, taking a look at it, and again, more than one way to do it. But the way that I see right here popping out at me is if I carry a line across like that, well, now I have a triangle in the bottom part here, and I'd have a rectangle up here in the top. And I can find out the area of these two shapes independently, add them two together, and get my total area. So, okay, great. In order to do that, I need to figure out this value, this price. And what, what is that? Well, that's the point where I have a quantity of eight into either my marginal revenue or my marginal cost curve. So what I want to do is take eight, put it into either of those two, and I'm going to get this corresponding value there. So let's go use the marginal revenue function and let's calculate that price. So price equals 150 minus 10 times eight. So hey, that's price is 150 minus 10 times eight, that's 80. That gives us all together a price equal to $70. So 70, we can throw that in. There we go. And right, how do we interpret that? That's actually our marginal cost or the marginal revenue from that eighth unit produced. But back to figuring out our producer surplus, what we need to do is figure out this rectangle and this triangle. So let's start off with the, I'll just kind of graphically show it, that rectangle. Okay, that rectangle is just base times height. That's eight times the height of 110 minus 70, that's gonna be 40. Eight times 40, that yields for us 320. Great, okay. Now we need to find out the area of this triangle. Well, that's gonna be one half, again, base of eight, height of, what's our height here? 70 to 30. So 70 minus 30 gives us another 40. One half, eight, 40, hey, we did that right here. That's 160. So we see all together our total producer surplus, 320 plus 160, that's gonna yield for us a producer surplus of 480. Which, hey, considering the original producer surplus of 360, we see that producers are significantly better off. What about society? Last agent in this to consider, not really an agent, but the every agent all put together. So in this case, we have our 480 from the producer plus 160 from the consumer, giving us $640 worth of social surplus altogether. Comparing the two, 720 down to 640, we see that society loses, right? That loss, that difference between that 720 and now that 640, that difference is our dead weight loss. And we see, okay, 720 minus 640 gives us a dead weight loss of 80. And where does that geometrically? That's this triangle here. 
this triangle here was used to be received by one party or the other. Now, no one gets it. Now it's a loss to society. So we have our welfare analysis conducted for either a monopoly or a firm in a monopolistically competitive market. Outside of that, again, what is the distinction between a monopolist and a firm in a monopolistically competitive market? The difference is that a monopolist, a monopolist has barriers. That is, there's things in place, these could be natural or created barriers, that prevent entry from occurring. That is, for a monopolist, because of these barriers, they can continue to earn profit into the long run. However, if we take a look at a, monopoly, a firm in a monopolistic, monopolistic competitive market, well, in this case, there's no barriers. And keep in mind what we meant by monopolistic competition. In monopolistic competition, sure, you had a monopoly over your version of the good. So, for example, if we're talking about the market for cheeseburgers, only McDonald's has a monopoly over Big Macs. They're the only ones who can sell Big Macs. Everybody else isn't allowed to. They have the trademark. So, McDonald's has a monopoly over the Big Mac. That being said, there's close substitutes to the Big Mac. It's not like people are like, oh man, Big Mac, that's it. That's my only option. No, there's lots of other cheeseburgers out there. So in that sense there, because there's lots of fairly close substitutes, we do have competition between the different providers. In this case here, what ends up happening is if McDonald's is able to be making lots of positive profit off of their monopoly on Big Macs, this is just a signal to other firms to say, hey, if we can kind of make our version of the Big Mac, we can get at some of this profit. As we get at some of this profit, we can end up impacting the current tastes, preferences, and expectations, really tastes and preferences for Big Macs, and we can kind of steal some of that. We can get some people to like ours better. As they like ours better, the existing demand curve would begin to shift to the left. As that existing demand curve shifts to the left, so does the marginal revenue. Thus, this existing monopolistic, this firm in a monopolistically competitive marketplace ends up having lower quantities and lower prices, pushing them towards zero profit. So that is in this scenario, our difference between, well, there's a lot of differences, but differences in this scenario between a monopolist and a firm in a monopolistically competitive marketplace the difference is in the long run. That is, a monopolist can continue to hold this long run profit where a firm in a monopolistically competitive marketplace cannot. They will be, they will be pushed to zero profit, just like our perfectly competitive firms. The difference compared to perfect competition, even though these guys are pushed to zero profit, they will still not be allocatively efficient. That is, they will still not be at the equilibrium point here. They'll still operate lower than what we want from supply equals demand, so they would still operate below our allocatively efficient point. Okay, big takeaways from this video though, we're ultimately calculating Q star, calculating the market price, and working out our welfare analysis for a monopoly or a firm in a monopolistically competitive marketplace. That other bit about a bit of the theory, for more information on that, please go take a look at the video on imperfect competition where we specifically go through monopolistically competitive firms and talk about the basis of the theory behind them. Should you have any other questions though on these calculations, please feel free to comment below, post onto D2L, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks, until next time.